Hello there. Um, welcome to today's edition of Blue Talks. Um, and today we'll be continuing our um, session um, on the impact of COVID-19 on key focus sectors. Um, I still have with me Olu, um, and today he has um, um, another set of um, amazing ladies. I mean, maybe Olu, you can explain that they've all been ladies that you've had throughout this week, just six of them in your team. I mean, your team was really, really hot. And today um, we're, we're talking um, financial um, institutions yeah. and conglomerates, you know. So um, they'll be walking us through um, just letting us have an insight into some of the conversations they're having with the clients. And which generally will give us an insight into what the market in itself is looking forward to and the kind of expectations um, we should have from the market. Olu, how are you doing today? How are you doing, Tayo? Happy. Uh, I'm very well, thank you. Yeah, Friday. Um, it's been a busy week, but thanks for hosting us. And I hope uh, the sessions have been useful uh, to the audience. Yeah, I, I think they have. I mean, feedback has been phenomenal. Um, okay. I mean, on YouTube or on here, there have been um, quite a bit of interaction. Um, I think people. Um, are seeing the value uh, more and more each day. Uh, it's unfortunate that this um, these sessions will end today um, with the um, with the third um, installment. But hopefully, we should have you back soon uh, and be able sure. to you. You know, gain more insights. You know, um, most likely post post COVID um, when there's a bit more to talk about. Okay, so thanks everyone for joining us. Um, again, I'll just, I'm not, I don't want to assume that uh, those who have been joining uh, over the last two sessions, uh, I'm sure they've heard uh, what I'm about to say, but the new audience, just to give an insight as to the team that is speaking to them today. Um, so my name is Olu Dela and I lead the client relationship team at Stambik IBTC. Um, and with, with the way we look at uh, clients, we have them in three primary buckets. Um, one in personal and business banking that deals with uh, personal accounts and corporate accounts. Uh, wealth management that uh, manages portfolio of um, pensions and asset management, including uh, um, trusteeship as well. And in corporate and investment banking, which has companies of around $20 million, that's about 10 billion naira, on average and above, uh, those are the corporates that sit in our portfolio. And because of the sophistication that we bring to the table, we have them in sectors. There are six primary sectors that we uh, we work with. One is uh, conglomerate and industrials, uh, consumer sector, uh, oil and gas, power and infrastructure, financial institutions, and um, telecom, media, and technology. Uh, today we have the uh, two, the last two sectors that we cover, uh, which is conglomerate and industrials, as well as uh, financial institutions. Um, over the last couple of weeks, again, you know, we've had this issue of COVID-19 uh, just from about uh, 27th of February when we got in Nigeria the first positive test. And now we have just over uh, 2,800 uh, in the country. So it's been really... Uh, it, 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 it's a difficult situation. The government had to lock down most of, most of the cities uh, or the states, rather. And so we want to discuss with the audience um, uh, and our sector heads, what, what have they been discussing over the last couple of uh, weeks? So um, we have Bola Ajibode, uh, who runs our conglomerate and industrial team. And Bola, how are you doing? Uh, okay, um, I think Bola just dropped off. Uh, I'm not sure if Bola is still there. Bola, are you there? Um, I'm not sure. I, I can't see her right now. I guess she'll come back on momentarily. Okay, so the, the, the conglomerates, just to keep the, the process going, uh, it's, a con it's a group of uh, corporates uh, that sit in that world. Earlier this week, We've, we've spoken to uh, consumer sector, we've spoken to oil and gas, telecom, media and technology, um, power and infrastructure. And now we're speaking to uh, Bola's team, which, which consists of conglomerate companies. Now, those companies, they include 
uh, real estate, uh, airlines, uh, shipping, uh, packaging companies, steel, uh, and chemicals uh, as one of those corporates. And those corporates sit in, in Bola's world. Um, I'll just continue uh, until she joins us. Um, so th those corporates, they, they tend to, uh, you know, they're mostly corporates to corporates. They grow their business. Um, we engage them in a number of ways. Um, uh, and again, uh, just as this slide shows, airlines, shipping, real estate, uh, mining and metals, as well as healthcare. So we look at the, the areas that, uh, uh, that we focus on. Packaging is an in, a very important area, of course. Uh, packaging will be uh, plastics, uh, glass, and, 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 and um, aluminum in cans. So they would provide uh, solutions to... Hello, Lou. Bola is coming through now. Hopefully we can... Okay, Bola, <laughs> welcome back. Hello, Lou, can you hear me? Yes, carry on, please. Yes, carry on. Apologies, I, I lost you. Um, no thank worries. you. It's, it's a pleasure to be on air with our clients. Um, let me quickly um, go through what we do in conglomerates and industrial. I don't know whether you have mentioned that. Can I quickly do that before I answer yes, your please. question? Carry on, carry on, Bola. <laughs> the team um, is in charge of uh, or is managing about eight different sectors. Broadly, we manage core industrial sectors, real estate, and mining. Uh, under our core industrial sectors, we have iron and steel, packaging, chemical, and healthcare. We also manage aviation clients, automobile, and real estate. And lately, we have been developing the mining sector for, for stomach IBTC, and largely because we are a member of Sana Bank Group, and we have a dedicated team uh, responsible for growing the mining portfolio, leveraging on the expertise and experience of Standard Bank. Um, for next slide, let me go. Down. Okay, so for the purpose of this exercise, we will only be focusing on the core industrial sectors, which is packaging, healthcare, chemical, and I want to still, I will dwell into that later. So, but there is a commonality which I would like us to, to, to note before we move ahead. Um, in, the, in the industrial space, a number of them, I mean, largely all of them are import dependent in terms of input of their raw materials. Um, when you look at the, the, body, the, the, the total imports last year, 20, 2019, 70, 47, 0.4 billion dollars was total import. 50% of that was responsible for um, industrials. And it's largely for importation of machinery and raw materials. So these are guys that are highly import dependent. And again, what is also common because of the large import importation, they have, the value chain has to, be, has to be managed. And again, apart from managing their value chain, there is also the need for them to ensure that the logistics is very is very is very on top, and most of them are largely in business to business. I.e., they don't sell to the last man on the streets, so they sell to opticals who then put their input into their production process. So when you describe a company as conglomerate, that is a company that operates in three unrelated industries. Um, so that is when, and, and they are largely diversified companies. We have a, lot, a, number, a number of them around in Nigeria. So I will now be specific to your question and address what we saw in packaging and what our clients in packaging shared with us during the lockdown. In, so I'll, go, I'll start with glass. Our glass manufacturers, um, they were slightly impacted because 40% of um, glass manufacturing is targeted at beer manufacturers to breweries. So the green bottles were not produced during the lockdown, Olu. And it's, it's obvious, beer was not classified as an essential item. So that's part of their business. Actually, those of them who are producing in Lagos and Ogun State had to shut down that side of their business. So what they, what they did was to um, just keep the furnace warm and hot 
because they cannot allow the furnace to shut down completely to be it should not be effective for them so what they did was they did what they call streaming so they were just streaming and then getting the furnace um, warm and then um for the aluminum cans also aluminum cans they, they kind of follow this the the, the parts of, of bottles because they also supply the, the breweries so that part of their business was also impacted but they, they were able to supply producers um so they were able to supply uh, producers of uh, soft drinks non-alcoholic um, um, beverages so so in terms of um in terms of production they were about 50 percent down um for in, in uh, the aluminum producers for um for plastic we really don't manage a lot of plastic uh, manufacturers because they are largely small they're not large copy as you have described uh, some the turnover of our clients are quite large but what we we know happened to them they were quite good uh, because they, they they actually supply non-alcoholic beverages companies so they were they were good and supply chain was not so much of an issue for them because most of their products are are i mean their inputs are also local they pick most of the pets from 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 um, local manufacturers for cartons um, what we saw in carton is very interesting because these are guys who convert used cartons and to make their own pop. And because of that, they were in business. So they, they didn't have challenges of moving their raw materials from the port because they had the, the scrap they, they could convert. Again, they were also targeting, I mean, they target um, F, FMCGs. So as a result, they were in business throughout the, the lockdown. So these were the guys that really smiled to their bankers. Um, I'll go to. And then um, the next one is chemicals. In our chemical business, um, what we saw was uh, a, a, a high demand for soap noodles, for instance, because everybody was washing hands. You know, washing your hands require you using what? Soap. So there was high demand for soap noodles. And we also saw a huge demand for polyethylene and polypropylene. And so clients made us realize that there was spike even in, in price because they have to use this for most of these pets that is required for production of um, pet bottles for the soft drinks. So we saw that happening. And again, chemical is highly import dependent. So their, their supply chain was impacted. So that's what we saw in, in chemical. Um, uh, our steel manufacturers shared not so good news because all their factories were shut down because steel, of course, was not essential. But they, I mean, even the converters too, the steel converters also shut down during the during the the, the lockdown the season. But they were surprisingly they were also getting orders because guys were placing orders because they they will they when they were anticipating increase in prices. So they will saw pre-orders coming in for them. And some of them were even depositing before, before the, the lockdown was, was opened. They were taking money to banks and we were wondering ah, what, what happened. I mean, you guys are not selling. But their clients were paying ahead of when uh, the, the lockdown will be opened. And now we can see that they are supplying all the guys that have pre-ordered. So that is what the manufacturers of steel shared with us. And of course, um, our our new baby the healthcare healthcare hmm, that is an industry that has been begging for attention even before covid we all know that why because nigeria i mean we, i mean the, the budget into healthcare has been very small and but what we saw immediately the COVID
हेलो 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 कैन हेयर मी इट्स टाइम हेलो इट्स टाइम आई कैन हेयर यू आई कैन हेयर यू ओके यू कैन हेयर मी ओके आई एम सॉरी आई कैन हेयर एनीबॉडी ओके अम So we're trying to get Olu back on there, back on here. Um, I'm sure he has some okay. technical glitches. Um, okay. Even I was struggling to hear you back after a while. I've been. Um, were you done with the session before? I think you're done yeah, already. I was, just, I was just rounding up on healthcare, but I've not finished. Can okay, you? I think you can go ahead with that um, while we wait for. Thank you. Slides. Okay. You so I was saying. Okay, and so apologies for the glitches. I was saying that um, the healthcare sector is continue to attract attention from government and private sectors, even post COVID. And because whether it's good time or bad time, people will always get sick anyway. And um, it is time for Nigeria, as we see now, um, the high medical tourism uh, will, will, is, is important for us to capture that market. It's about $1.3 billion that Niger Nigerians spend abroad you know, looking for medical, for medical services. So that's an area that will, will attract attention going forward. And then um, the industry have been very blessed with a lot of government palliatives. Government has um, put up a lot, put up a, come, or come up with a number of um, measures that will cushion the effect of COVID on a number of our clients. Um, in the healthcare space, for instance, government uh, is, is, has, has put up an intervention fund for them, um, and it's going to take them two years moratorium, and it's 10 years, 10 years, you know? This is what this, um, this is the kind of capital, or I would say patient capital, that the industry has been waiting for, and is now here for clients in that sector to, to tap. Again, government is, um, is considering, or, or rather, the government is actually engaging client, um, banks to to support most of the clients that might be that might be impacted with with um, low demand and restrict. We are going to be restructuring some of the some some of the loans, and government is going to give us some palliatives. I mean, to allow us um, to allow our, our, our players, industrial players, to have some kind of um, breathing space because of the, the impact of COVID. On, on their business. So I'll wait for a question because um, I don't know whether I will lose available to, to ask questions. Let me stop here. Hello. Hello. Olu, are you back? I was here. I can hear you, Bola. I can hear you. Can you hear me? I have a question. Olu, are you back? Um, Olu is trying to log on. But I have a question for you, Bola. Can you hear me? I can hear you.
Hi, Bola. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. I'm done. I have a, I have a question for you. Okay, go ahead. Okay, so what should companies in the industrial sector be doing post COVID-19? Hmm. Very good question. Um, let's start with what impacted a number of them. One is their inputs. A number of them, like I said, are highly dependent on, on foreign inputs. So industrials will need to be more strategic going forward on in terms of uh, backward integration and ensuring that they, they, they diversify the, 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 the sources of their, of their raw materials and largely look inwards for the source of their raw materials. The input is key for them, especially now that foreign exchange, foreign, foreign, foreign exchange is going to be a major concern after, I mean, now it's now a major concern that's going to be, it's going to be in for the next one year. So foreign, foreign exchange is going to be a major, a major, a major challenge for them. So they should be looking at uh, backward integration, looking for local inputs. The second thing that they need to also work on is so, also spread their their business their their business um looking for diverse, i mean looking for other related businesses that they can venture into diversifying their portfolio is very important for them and also tidying up their their supply chain so that is that is what a number of well, these guys should be doing to reduce the impact of what is coming ahead okay thank Ebola. you i think um, olu is back so let me let me step aside <laughs> Well, um, apologies. I, I actually heard the presentation, but somehow the connection was uh, not too good. So, I mean, you suggested what they should be doing, but how can we, uh, with stamp diabetes, how can we then support support them on that journey? Okay, um, stamp diabetes, being an invest had, with investment banking background, has a lot to offer at this time. Um, here is we are we are moving into an era where cash is going to be king, capital is going to be impacted. So a number of these guys, we need to raise fresh capital in the market. And we can offer, offer that with, with our equity capital market desk. Again, a number of them, we need to restructure their balance sheet. We have our financial, financial advisory services that we will put on the table for our clients. Some way you will need to you know, go into raising of long-term bonds and, and commercial paper and our investment banking team will be readily available to do that for them again i say i said cash is king um mm -hmm. corporates will need to we need to augment their working capital because um of, mm -hmm. of what we what we what we will begin to witness being cap, uh, working capital constraints so we'll be putting that you know on the table for them even for their staff um staff may not be able to access loans from their employers anymore so um where we will cover the, the staff loans for them and even suppliers credit will not be available so we will, we will be giving facility to their suppliers so we have a we, we, you know a portfolio of products mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I think we've uh, lost that again. Apologies, uh, the network for today has just been difficult. And I think what Bola is again highlighting is uh, we're available to engage these companies uh, in terms of funding, uh, cash management solutions, uh, both on both payments and, 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 and cash collection side. And of course, digitization and the value chain. Uh, that was an area that um, Abola would I uh, will have emphasized as well, um, uh, and then of course you know across the uh, the wealth management. Yes, those companies may think that in these tough times, but one should do or whatever percentage that you do earn, you should still try to keep some of those. Uh, keep some of those aside uh, to save up on. So um, in the industrial area, definitely capital expenditure is an area that. Uh, they should be focusing on. And I'm not, I think the last one that um, Bola did mention was on M&A, um, mergers and acquisitions, to the extent that uh, there could be some opportunities for companies to diversify again further away from their business. Uh, that's an area that uh, they should uh, carry in with. Um, Taiwo, any other questions in the, from the public? 
Um, not at this moment. Uh, maybe we should move move on to the next segment and then we'll we collect yeah. questions and we'll ask, we'll ask them afterwards. So let's get uh, you and me on dying and, and let's uh, have that chat with her in the F5. You and me, are you on? Hello, you and me, can you hear us? You want to, can you hear us? I can hear you. I don't know if you can hear me. Yes, we can. Yes, we can. We can hear you. Okay, but um, but I'm trying to put on the the camera because it's not. Okay. Hi, Olu, can you see me or can you, I mean, no, I can, I can see you. Can see you. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, it's a shame. Uh, the, the, you, you're struggling with the camera? Yeah, it was, it was on. Just now. Okay. Okay. I think, have we lost you one day completely? I can hear you, Olu. Okay, so let's let's carry on. Let's carry on. Um, so, Yewande, how are you doing? <laughs> okay, very well. Um, so let's let's carry. I mean, in FI, um, we've had uh, again COVID nineteen. What are what are our companies, uh, our clients in the FI world? What have they been sharing with us? Well, okay, um, in the FI world. Well, there's been lots of things happening um, at the moment, and that's because of um, the impact of COVID. Um, you have seen um, a lot of institutions trying to ensure that uh, work from home is adopted significantly, and you have found people actually streamlining their workforce into three different buckets. You have the essential staff, staff members, you have people working from home, and then you also have people working from the disaster recovery sites. So you have that spread across um, the whole financial institution spectrum. But having said that, I think um, um, it's, it's, it's key or, or clear to say that um, um, the banking industry has, and the whole financial institution terrain has remained resilient and um, work has actually gone on as it should. Okay. So I think, you know, let's carry on. I mean, going to share what um, uh, financial institutions means to us at Stambik IBTC. Probably want to share some of that insight with the, our viewers. <laughs> Are you Andy? Are you on? I think she's up again. Oh, she got, oh, wow. Okay. I'm, I, I can't be the one making these presentations. <laughs> uh, um, just wait a bit. I uh, mean, I'm happy to share with the with the audience what, what how we engage our, our clients in the financial institutions world. Um, okay, can you hear me now? Yes, carry on, carry on, Yemandi, we can hear you. Development finance institutions, microfinance institutions, and non-bank finance institutions. So, I mean, I'll just um, go um, further, further into details to sort of explain um, what we're doing in commercial banks. So commercial banks are actually the banks that act as intermediaries between the surplus spending unit and the deficit spending unit. That's basically what it is, and provides, provides services to all the to, to individuals and corporates al alike. What you find, um, another bucket that you find there is the non-interest licensed banks. So the non-interest licensed banks in Nigeria, we only have two non-interest licensed banks. 
So those non-interest licensed banks are banks that are built on principles that uphold ethical messages. So basically there's avoidance of interest, contractual and legal certainty, and of course, leniency to debtors. So basically that's what um, non-interest licensed banks do. And then we also have merchant banks. So merchant banks ideally are um, deal in um, investments to corporates and large organizations. So historically, merchant banks used to facilitate um, the finance and production of trade um, um, commodities. But in recent times, micro merchant banks has metamorphosed and they are now facilitating and providing capital in the form of share ownership and loans to um, institutions that are interested in. And so what we find is they also provide um, financial advisory services to some of those institutions where they have equity investments in. So microfinance banks are basically banks that provide financial services to the um, excluded end of the market. The key word here is microfinance banks are focused on the, the lower end where people are economically active. What do I mean by that? They really have something that they're doing. However, the income is low, is irregular and unpredictable. So, you know, for banks, you generally be able to um, draw a theme or draw um, a pattern from the flows of, of, um, of that, that that you see. But for um, microfinance institutions, you typically not have that. All you would have for microfinance institutions is a situation wherein they, they, they look at the bottom end of the, of the pyramid and ultimately to ensure that it provides services. Um, ideally, what we find here is about um, a few years ago, Efina had come up with, the, with, with some um, work that showed that about 64% of Nigerians were actually excluded from the financial, from financial institution world. And so microfinance was, is looking at that. Currently in Nigeria, we have um, almost 900 microfinance institutions. And um, this is also regulated by the CBN. We also have the development finance institutions. DFIs, as the name implies, pretty much focused on developing critical sectors of the economy. And you find um, some of the DFIs focused on um, agriculture, manufacturing, or what have you. But ultimately, it's um, ensuring that critical sectors of the economy is, is developed. So I'll be moving on to the insurance um, sector now, I mean, to the non-bank financial institutions. So the non-bank financial institution is actually um, focused across six broad six sectors. So we have the insurance companies, we have asset managers, we have alternate investment vehicles, bankers, brokers and exchanges, pension fund regulators. I'll just give you a brief into, into insurance. So, I mean, insurance penetration in Nigeria is currently less than 1%. I'll help you understand what I mean. So if you compare Nigeria to other developing, um, developing markets such as Thailand, India, Vietnam, and other emerging markets, you see that the premium collection in Nigeria is significantly low in comparison to others. And that's because of our um, insurance penetration. As mentioned, we are less than 1%. So there's loads of opportunities here and we'll discuss um, various ways in which we can collaborate with our clients and, um, and, and work with, 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 with you or what, whatever your thoughts are in terms of helping you to um, align to that. We also have asset managers. Asset managers are basically interested or looking at improving and driving yield for their clients. They want to drive yield, however, within a framework that is risk mitigated. So they, in as much as they're doing that, they're driving risk. So remember, there are six core sectors that we have insurance, asset management, alternate investment vehicles, brokers and exchanges, niche finance institutions, and pension fund regulators. So moving on to the next slide, you know, this is just something that talks about the key themes that we're seeing. So there's a regulatory oversight and the regulatory oversight is just to ensure that um, the industry is resilient and able to withstand the shocks of um, that that is going to come be it covid be it um, be it um, foreign currency exchange whatever it is um, regulatory oversight is is, is is closely is closely monitored within within the financial institution world we all have all price volatility and the possible impact on Nigeria's economy. And of course, how does this um, impact, um, impact our business? It's just, it's a, it's a major thing that we're seeing. 
oil price is currently um, is, is low. And so because 90% of our foreign currency exchange earnings is gotten from oil, and because it's gotten from oil, because it's low, there's obviously going to be an impact on every business that has an exposure to that. To, to, to that. Mm -hmm. Another key theme that we're seeing is recapitalization of microfinance banks. Um, in the last week of April, the CBN governor recently announced that um, he's given a forbearance um, and an extension to, to recapitalization of microfinance banks. So the, the de initial deadline was 2020, but that has now been pushed out to 2022 and 2021. There's also the insurance sector recapitalization, which is currently ongoing with a deadline of, um, of December 2020. We've heard of rumors of possible um, consolidation within the banking sector. Um, so those are some of the things that we're seeing. And across, we have actually seen an increased usage in online on, in online platforms and service delivery of, um, of the products of our clients, the asset management. So you find situations where individuals sit in the comfort of their homes and are able to originate an investment based on the decision that they've taken. And so ultimately, um, the clients we're seeing are able to um, ensure that as much as possible, they continue to offer good service to their clients, even despite the lockdown situation that we have or that we had in Nigeria. Um, moving on to the next slide. So, I mean, this pretty much just um, is some of the things that I've, that I've spoken about, um, the reduced um, flows from, from foreign currency um, earnings and um, the possible uh, impact that that would have. On, on, on the Naira, the depreciation. But having said that, um, the, the industry remains, um, re remains resilient and is sort of based on the regulatory uh, monitoring to ensure that um, we remain um, resilient to handle those challenges as they come. So I'll just talk quickly on the risk that we've seen. We've put our risk into four main buckets, um, credit risk, regulatory risk, liquidity risk, and cyber and fraud risk. I'll be focusing on, um, on credit risk um, at the moment. Um, so about um, a few weeks back, we had the sovereign downgraded. What do I mean? Um, Nigeria was downgraded by um, some international rating agencies. And of course, that has a resultant effect in um, the, the credit ratings for financial institutions. And of course, that's also negative for trade finance because you see international, international banks begin to review their exposures to the country, begin to increase the pricing of trade lines that, uh, that in, in the market. But notwithstanding what we're saying, not, not, notwithstanding what we're saying, but the, um, the, the market remains resilient as much as possible to manage some of this um, credit risk. There's also the challenge with um, foreign exchange um, the, the foreign exchange here is the threat to asset quality. When we look at the asset books of, of um, some of um, the, the banks or the people that are exposed to, to foreign currency, and the fact that um, there is the possibility that those asset quality might, um, might have some challenges because of the impact of um, foreign exchange. Another thing I'd like to highlight here is cyber and fraud risk. Uh, because of the work from home, um, remote working that we're, we're having, I mean, there are loads of um, cyber and fraud um, that um, um, the industry may be, may, be, may be exposed to because of um, work, staff having to work from various, um, various work, work, work locations and, and what have you. But I haven't said that it's, um, it's something that... Um, um, is to build on their on their fiber attacks or whatever um, it is that is being planned against those organizations. I'll just go on to the next slide. Um, so we, we sort of try to um, highlight the different um, effects of um, COVID nineteen. We put them into three different buckets: short term effect, long term effect, and medium term effect. So the short-term effect, one of the short-term effects, or some of it is the fact that people have risk of sentiment. People are sort of, you know, there's a standoffish attitude to the fact that, um, you know, the, the, what is currently happening is something that has never been experienced before. Nobody has had um, a pandemic um, of this nature 
coupled with um, what we're currently having with respect to the oil. So people are sort of risk coffish and, and sort of standoffish. But I dare to say that in every volatility, there's always an opportunity for those that are willing and, and I mean, willing to take or, or make a move. Um, another short term effect we see is um, relief funds from um, DFIs and, and, and the CBN. We've seen various initiatives by the government. I mean, government recently exempted small businesses from company income tax. Um, tax rate for medium-sized companies was also revised downwards. All these are some of the um, uh, short-term effects to sort of help manage and help um, play ameliorate the challenges with the with, that they're facing in the in the market. Medium-term effects are effects I've put into the one to two-year bucket, and that pretty much talks to. Um, cost containment and agile operations. So we see that um, the work from home scenario is something that will pretty much drive um, an agile work work, work operations. I, I don't think work life will ever be the same again with, with what is currently happening and then people are going to try to ensure that they remain um, they remain they remain in contact with their clients and whatever they would need to do that will be done. Another key thing to mention here is um, possible recapitalization of the insurance um, and banking sectors, as, as we have mentioned earlier on. And there's also um, possible uh, mergers and acquisition. Those are some of the medium term effects that, that, we, that we expect to see in the, in, the, in the one to two year bucket. And for long term effects, one thing we would like to highlight here is um, the strong collaboration that will happen between technology, telecoms, insurance companies, banks, asset managers, the whole the whole works. What do I mean by that? Basically, what this is saying is just that historically people have built platforms individually, but we believe that there will be a whole lot of collaboration that is going to happen and um, people will work together to build platforms to ensure that they're able to provide services to their clients as much as, 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 much as, as, as possible. And um, the few, next few slides now talk about um, the impact of um, COVID on the subsector within the financial institution world. And I'll just be talking you through some of them. So um, because of, um, so talking to the banks now, because of, um, of um, the impact of COVID and coupled with um, the, the low, the low um, oil price, is possibly going to be a breaches of single obligor limits. And where, where there are breaches of single obligor limits, we'll find that um, um, there'll be um, possible distribution or collaboration with, 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 all, with other institutions just to ensure that um, everyone remains within the single obligor limits threshold that's set by the regulator. There's also, we also expect um, a lower net interest income because of risk mitigation tightening. Everyone will want to review and ensure that deals that go, goes through their, their, their books are, are, are deals that have been looked through and, um, and um, refined and agreed on by, by, by the team. Another thing that we see is um, a spike in electronic banking fees. So we expect that um, there will be um, th that line of income will continue to will, will spike in in um, Q2. So we can't really look at that for Q1 because we only had one month of COVID when we look at the Q1 numbers. But taking on into Q2, we think that um, we would have um, a spike in the electronic banking fees. Another thing I'd like to highlight here um, is the um, impact of these on, on offshore banks and, and foreign portfolio investors. So because of the reduced um, foreign currency supply, we, we, we see the possibility of um, of uh, the players trying to externalize their position as much as possible. And um, in, in trying to do that, we imagine that there might be reduced uh, return on some of the foreign portfolio investments across Nigeria. Another thing here is uh, foreign cor correspondent banks. In the advent of COVID and the oil price, majority of them has reviewed their prices upwards across the industry. And so what you find is a situation where pricing on trade has been reviewed upwards. And so trade-related um, income, we believe that will continue to reduce. Um, for the insurance um, sector, we imagine that um, whatever exposures that they have foreign currency, that everyone will be on the move to look at conversion of that into, into local currency as, as, as much as possible, just to manage the possible depreciation that may occur. 
Um, another thing to highlight here is um, because of the lockdown and individuals not being able to go about their business, we expect that there might be a I mean, reduction in retail in retail business. And so a portion of um, the gross total premium might reduce. And so the impact of that will be reduced premium income from the retail businesses. But notwithstanding, we see we see opportunities here because um, there's there's a possibility that Nikon uh, may be looking to postpone the the, um, the the deadline for compliance with um, the capital raise, which was initially set for December 2020. We understand that a couple of market players has already engaged Nikon to look at uh, moving the date further down the line, just so and to ensure that um, capital um, initiatives are able are, are gotten and over the line in a positive manner. For the asset managers, I mean, there's lower appetite for Naira denominated assets. And so we expect that um, um, because of the depressed valuation of euro bonds, we see um, the majority of the asset managers looking at expanding and, in, and improving their assets appetite platforms like it's in the comfort of their homes and actually initiate transactions and we expect to see um, an increased participation in euro bonds from the asset managers and alternate um, investment vehicle um so so lastly um i'll just like to talk about brokers and exchanges so brokers and exchanges um really um it's looking at stock brokers and the fact that how they have ideally um impacted with the with um with um the challenges with with covid so what you find, what, what you find is, um, I mean, the equities are at an all-time low. And so, like I mentioned, there's opportunity for, 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 for us to collaborate with our clients in, in this regard. I mean, I don't know what you might be thinking about. Is it um, as in a, from a stockbroking perspective? Is it from a mergers and acquisition perspective? Because, I mean, think about it. Equities are at all-time low. Do you want to take advantage of that to look at um, um, companies that you might have been following for the for the past few years, we can work with you, actualize your dreams, and help you put together what it, whatever it is you're thinking. Working with our global market, our um, stock booking team in, within the Stambik IBT city. So I think I'll pause here to take questions. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Um, uh, thanks for that, and again, apologies to uh, the audience uh, for the uh, interruption. Uh, but again, you know, uh, we just know now that uh, we need to continue to invest significantly in in this uh, connection uh, for Wi-Fi and, and possibly cable to our to our homes, so we can get the right uh, connection. But thanks, you know, So let's quickly around. You know, we're expecting companies to not be agile. Uh, in the last four weeks. We've all had to adapt very quickly, work from home, school, our uh, kids, uh, uh, our children are also uh, at home, uh, schooling. Families are learned very quickly how to teach and how to execute the teacher's request. So what should companies in FI world be doing uh, or should be focusing on uh, to, 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 to remain agile? Thank you, Olu. Um, so to remain agile, I think one thing that um, uh, organizations within the FI world need to focus on is on building uh, a, a strong and resilient um, uh, uh, banking, I mean, banking or electronic platform that sort of gives you access to be able to continuously serve your clients in the in the in the current situation that we have found ourselves in. So it's going to require IT software, hardware, whatever IT is, you know, that will ensure that you're able to accommodate a massive bandwidth of data. And I mean, I think the, the, the ideal thing here that I would like to highlight is the fact that data analytics is, is something that uh, people can actually use based on the fact that once your, your platform works, you will see that uh, individuals, your clients, your, your, your people that you're trying to serve, continuously access this, this platform. And you'll be able to build um, build um, uh, a solution from that. And ideally, you'll be able to proactively um, pitch product to your client based on the data analytics that you're able to gather from um, the usage of whatever platform it is that you're, that you're setting, setting into place. So I think one thing that we're, we'll take from this for, for the future is is ensuring that the new that the new way of working um, we're able to serve our clients 
as much as possible. And so your your, your platforms must be working um, significantly. I mean, within the within within Stambic IBTC coverage, we have a telecoms multimedia and technology, wherein um, we're able to support whatever initiative you're looking at in setting up your platform um, to ensure that you're digital, dig, digitally savvy and then um, uh, sort of foolproof for what the future holds for us in um, in, the, in Nigeria and in the world at, at large. Okay, thank you, Yohande. So in the FI, in the FI world, uh, it's a high regulated uh, sector, you know, depending on uh, the regulators, but it's a, it's a quite a highly regulated sector. So, so let's pivot slightly. What, what should regulators or to be thinking of or be doing to help accelerate the, the, the improvements? Uh, for the players in the FI world uh, to improve, to get out of uh, the COVID-19 situation, at least to improve on it? Okay. I just have one more question, and then we've got some questions in the chat room for us. Um, uh, you know, there are low yields right now, uh, and with the risk of uh, de de depreciation of the Naira, um, you know, what are the opportunities uh, for non-banking financial institutions in this uh, current market right now? All right. Thanks. Thanks, Olu. I think... Um one of the opportunities that I believe exists, that we believe exists for um, non-bank financial institutions is to begin to look at um, other sorts of funds um, that they can, they can establish. I mean, historically, um, the, the, the focus was to be on um, uh, foreign portfolio, I mean, um, money, fixed income securities and what have you. But what we what we now have is, you know, for them to look outside the box and begin to think about creating infrastructure funds, creating um, agriculture funds. I mean, when you think about the agriculture prowess of Nigeria, it's massive. And um, within Stambic ITC, we have a whole lot of um, an initiative in which we can we can support the whole backward integration that is required in a Greek. So I think it will be important for, for non-bank financial institutions to think about ways in which they can put up agriculture funds um, to support the, the growth in the, in the industry, in the real sector of the economy. Another way is look at the infrastructure. There's an infrastructure gap, ideally, that we have in the, in, in, in the country. So um, I guess it's for non-bank financial institutions to begin to look at ways in which they can bridge that gap and ultimately provide value and returns to their underlying clients as much as possible and um, doing all of this within a risk um, um, risk mitigated environment. Okay, thanks, Iwandi. Um, I'm just gonna go through some of these, uh, the questions just to touch on. 
Uh, is your bank planning specific products to help your clients embark on the necessary backward integration uh, they require? Yes, uh, we, we, when we look at backward integration, uh, both in agri and what Bola was indicating around um, mining, uh, yes, we do. Uh, from a Stambi Capital's perspective, we are a universal financial service organization. Um, so what we will encourage is absolutely engage with us, reach out to us, and uh, depending on what sector you're focusing on, I'm assuming this question relates to agribusiness, uh, we will absolutely love to engage, understand where you where you want to focus on uh, in the value chain. And since it's back on integration with farming, um, there will be some funding, there will be some advice that we can provide as a program uh, in our business banking world. So we'll happy to make the connection. Uh, the next question uh, relates to uh, what are the, uh, can you want to share more light on alternative investment institutions? Uh, you want any, any thoughts?